Uh, I'm Charles Norman Shea. I'm Native American from the state of Maine. Uh, I belong to the Penobscot Indian Nation, which is uh, about 12 miles. And we live on an, an, a, a, an island in the Penobscot River. And uh, well, as uh, being an Indian in the state of Maine at that particular time, uh, we were looked down upon and uh, well, we had a life of our own. Uh, we, we lived on an island, we were more or less isolated. We had no bridge. Uh, when we had to cross the river, we crossed in the summertime in a battle that was rolled by a man that was in an elected position. The man was elected for that particular job and uh, well, then in the winter time, of course, and in the spring, winter time, we had to cross on the ice. In the spring, it was very uh, difficult, very dangerous <coughs> because uh, the ice was starting to melt and at this particular time, right across from our reservation on the mainland, there was a big sawmill and there, we used to get a lot of sawdust from there to spread across the ice to keep it from melting in the winter. But this was dangerous because uh, it would melt from underneath from the floor of the river. And there were always uh, dangerous spots of where you could go through the ice because we did not know them. It was because it was melting from underneath. Couldn't see On it. top, we had spread sawdust, and you could not see the danger spots. Wow! And what did your what did your parents do uh, growing up? Uh, well, I was born in Connecticut. Okay. Uh, my parents were not living at the res on the reservation at that particular time when I was born because uh, they had moved to Connecticut uh, for employment. And uh, I don't know, my wife, my wife, my mother was uh, working as a secretary. She had learned secretary skills when she was young. And uh, my father was working for the uh, uh, AMP uh, grocery concern that was uh, very popular at that particular time, Atlantic and Pacific. Uh, grocery stores or whatever they want to call them. And then the depression came, of course, and uh, my parents, uh, I guess they must have both lost their, their jobs because they were forced to move back to the reservation because they were not, they were unemployed and they were not making any money. So they could not pay rent or anything, so they moved back to the reservation. And what year was that approximately that you moved? That was, uh, well, I was born in uh, uh, 24, 1924. And uh, I think they moved back to the reservation in 28 or 29. I was about uh, four or five years okay. old. And then uh, were you able, to, did you go to school just like uh, normal? Did they have a school yeah, on well, the reservation? Uh, that's a, Another situation we had uh, on uh, on the reservation, we had our own schools, okay. but they were Catholic schools, and they were operated by nuns. And uh, my mother was of the opinion that uh, they were concentrating too much on religion, right, and uh, not preparing the children for future education, so. She decided that uh, when I was ready to go to school, that uh, I should go to the white schools, which were not on the reservation, but in the mainland okay. across the river. And uh, she placed me in the first grade. Uh, I was the only Indian boy in a class of about uh, 40 or 45 students, young students, of course, all my age, in the first grade. And uh, this was difficult for me because I had all of my friends who were Indian boys on the reservation 
and suddenly I found myself sitting in a schoolroom uh, full of white children, yeah. um, none of whom that I knew personally. How did and they treat they, you? How did they treat you? Well, I was treated, uh, as far as I remember, as far as I can remember, I was treated good. Uh, of course, they were all, were all the same age and uh, there was no opportunity uh, or no reason. They didn't know. They didn't know. know. Right. That I was an Indian boy, and of course they probably I'm sure they knew, but uh, we they did not treat me differently. Good. So, and <clears throat> so, what was it like? Uh, like how many kids were on the reservation growing up? How many? Well, I don't know that. I mean, uh, but uh, we numbered. Uh, I think the population. The entire population on the reservation at that particular time was about 500 people. Okay. Okay. So from 500, maybe 50 or 60 of them were children of perhaps of my age. Okay. And so you um, you went to high school as well. I, I stayed it. in the white schools all the way through first grade until I graduated high school in, uh, when did I graduate? I don't even remember now. 42, 1942. Yeah. What did you mean? And so uh, after after you graduated, uh, how did you how did you come to to uh, enlist in the army? How did that all play well, out? Uh, my parents had already they had moved back to uh, they had left the reservation again and moved to Massachusetts. Okay. Because of employment again. Uh, and they were working in the uh, Boston Navy Yard, which was located at Charleston, Massachusetts. My mother was again a secretary, and my father was living, I uh, was working in the ship uh, shipbuilding uh, profession as a carpenter. So, how did you come to join the military? How did that? How did that well, all? Uh, Play out. Like everybody else, we had to, uh, the Indian boys had to register for the draft. Right. Uh, but at this particular time, we had no voting rights. We were not permitted to vote in the state of Maine in any federal or local elections. And uh, this did not sit very well with my mother because my mother was an advocate for uh, rights for the Indian, for her Indian people, and uh, Voltwood was one of them. So she wrote to, at that particular time, she wrote a letter to President Roosevelt explaining her situation, that she had uh, four young boys that were being drafted into the military service, but we had no, no rights to vote and she did not think this was correct. Uh, my mother received an answer, of course not from the president himself, but one of his aides, and uh, he explained to her that uh, this was a problem between the Indian people and the state government, and the federal government had nothing to do with it because as far as the federal government was concerned, uh, we were recognized as uh, had voting rights. And, and full voting privileges. Yeah, voting privilege, already had voting privilege in the federal. But if we had a problem with voting rights in the state of Maine, that was a local government sure. problem. And you had three siblings. Pardon? You had three siblings. Yes, I had uh, we were four, four boys. Uh, Anyway, the uh, boys all this enlisted into the uh, two enlisted into the Navy, and one went into the Air Force, and uh, also enlisted. And I chose to be drafted because I was uh, supporting my mother. And you were the you were the middle. Uh, I was the second young second young, youngest second youngest. And just taking one step back, do you remember 
where you were at when Pearl Harbor happened. Can you remember uh, when you heard about it? Uh, let's see, Pearl Harbor happened when, 1942? December 1941, December 41. 7th, 1941. Well, I was still in school. Okay. So I did, uh, I graduated in 42, yeah. So I was still in school. Okay. No, not 42. Uh, yeah, 40, well, 40, 42. 42. No, that's when I went to the military service. I was already in the military service in 42. 42. 40 yeah well, I perhaps graduated 42 I think okay okay mm -hmm. that's well that's yeah. yeah that was that was just a couple of years ago <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um so you were drafted in you drafted into the army and where did they send you first where did you have to report uh well I was I was drafted from Massachusetts uh, from Massachusetts over there for Boston okay so therefore, I was uh, very close to Fort Devens, and when I was drafted, okay. that was where I entered the military service. Okay. And from Fort Devens, I was sent to Camp Pickett, Virginia, for basic training. Okay. For my introduction into the United States Army and uh, how it was constructed and what was expected of us and so forth. Okay. So you did uh, basic training after that? So, yeah. Then I was... Uh, I was sent to Camp Pickett, Virginia for okay. my basic training. And uh, this is where I learned about the Army. Uh, once my basic training was finished, I was uh, selected to become a medic. I don't know why I had no medical experience or anything, but uh, I was selected to be a medic and I was sent to Fort Benjamin Harrison, Indianapolis ah. to the uh, medical training schools. And I was trained as a surgical technician. And I thought that I would be working in the hospital after I was graduated from my uh, training, but this was not the case. I was a uh, sent on leave, went, went to back to my home for a few days leave, and then I was told to report to New York, and uh, out there I would board a ship and be transferred to England. Okay. Uh, I went home, and uh, when I got ready to report to New York, my mother went with me, and as far as I know, I don't know, uh, I just reported to New York and the next thing I knew I boarded the uh, Queen Elizabeth, which had been converted into a trans two transport ship. And uh, I don't know how many thousands of uh, a lot. men many. it held, but it was very many. And uh, the ship was very fast, so I therefore did not need an escort to travel across the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, I, my mother uh, uh, accompanied me to New York City, and I can recall her waving to me to say goodbye to me. Mm -hmm. uh, she said goodbye to me at the ship as, as close as she could get to me. It was very difficult, of course, but then and. When we sailed, I was, I could see her on the docks, and I was waving to her, and we waved to each other. And then, uh, I think it crossed. It took us uh, very. The ship was very fast. It took us about four or five days, I think, to cross the Atlantic Ocean. That is fast. And we landed. It, we landed in uh, on the coast of England. I don't remember which uh, port. And from there, I was transferred to a, uh, what they call the repo depot. It's a replacement uh, depot. And I only stayed a couple of days in this uh, repo depot and I was transferred to the, to Southern England, to the 16th Infantry Regiment, 2nd Battalion, uh, Medical Battalion. And uh, it was a small village. I I think the name of the village was uh, Bridport. Bridport, yes, and uh, 
Bridport, England. It's a small village in, in southern England, on the coast, southern coast. And uh, once I joined the medical department, uh, the uh, medical uh, unit, I was transferred to uh, one of the rifle companies to be a medic for that particular rifle company. I was, I was transferred to, I think, uh, D Company, uh, no, 2nd Battalion, yeah. F Company. 2nd Battalion. And I wound up anyway as a medic in uh, Company D. And there I, uh, of course, I trained uh, with them for a number of months with the company as a medic. Um, so, as you arrived in England in early 1944-ish, uh, do you remember approximately when you arrived no, I, in England? I arrived in England in the fall of 1944. Okay. And what type of training did they have you do? Uh, just was it medical training you were doing or? No, no, we were training. Uh, uh, we, we were on the coast of England and we were training. Uh, invasion. Invasion. Uh, techniques. We were training, uh, we were landing on the beaches and uh, we were trained as, uh, as medical aid men in the rifle company and I think uh, we, we were trained in uh, uh, I don't remember the name of the area, but anyway, it was uh, an area where the Germans had uh, slept in sands, I think it was. Okay. Slept in sands, yeah, that was it. This is where we did our training. And in this, in this particular area, the Germans were able to, uh, they had uh, very fast uh, uh, U-boats. U, well, not U-boats, no, uh, very submarines. fast uh, uh, type of boats, uh, combat boats of some sort. And they were able to penetrate the uh, defenses of the U.S. Army and U.S. Navy that was uh, oper operating in this particular area, slept in sands. And uh, they sank uh, several of the combat ships that the medical men, that the uh, Navy, uh, that the Army men were tra training on. And uh, I don't know how many of those ships they sank, but anyway, they killed about 750 American soldiers. And uh, this was kept secret because they did not want to alarm the, the uh, American public. What, of what happened, Interesting. and uh, it was a kept secret for many years, even after the war. But uh, that was. Uh, did you guys know that something? Did, did you did you know that something had happened? Yeah, did we you? knew something happened. Yes, okay. but uh, we know. were not given any information either. Uh, did they? Did you know that something big was coming? Did you? Have a oh feeling. yeah, well we we knew then eventually we were able to figure out that uh, we would someday be participating in the invasion of Europe. Did you have any idea where where you were going or where you were going to invade? Uh, well, we did not know exactly, but we knew that we would be invading Europe, and we we were able to uh, figure out that it would probably be in some place in France. We did not know Omaha Beach at that particular time. And uh, because everything was top secret, and but uh, that was eventually what happened. When did they did they pull you into the containment yards eventually uh, to stage for the yeah, invasion? Yeah, well, uh, it was uh, shortly there before uh, 
they crossed the channel and uh, anchored off the coast of, Norm of France or at Normandy Beach. And uh, it was just a few days uh, before it happened, we knew that we would be, we knew that uh, by that time we were able to deduce what was going on and we knew that uh, we were participating in a big invasion affair and uh, because uh, they could not keep it secret you know we, were, we knew that we were participating in something big did they did they lock you down before you boarded the oh yes ships? we were locked down we were not permitted to to uh, mingle with the citizens of the area and uh, we boarded ships, I think, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. So I don't even remember the name of the port where we boarded the ships to cross the English Channel. But anyway, there were thousands of ships uh, crossing the channel at that particular time. And we were only a small part of it. Uh, and we've crossed the channel and we anchored uh, uh, off the coast of Normandy about midnight on the uh, going in the 5th to the 6th of June and uh, this, the uh, invasion had been postponed for 24 hours because of the weather. The weather was very bad uh, and uh, very high seas. We had uh, when we even boarded on the early mornings of the 6th of June, we had seas that were producing waves uh, five, six, seven feet high. And uh, it was very difficult to board the ships because they were going up, you can imagine, going up difference of uh, five and six feet. And uh, we had to board, they just slung a net, a, a rope net over the side of the ship and they pulled up the uh, landing craft that we were using to get to the shores of Normandy to the side of the ship and we had to crawl down these land landing nets and uh, jump into the uh, landing craft but we had to jump in when they were at their highest level this meant and it was dangerous because uh, they were moving That's quite huge. fast you know and but uh, some of the men that had made it uh, were direct and then the rest of the men that followed them. And how much gear were you carrying at that point? Well, I was a medic, so I did not have much gear. I had, uh, I think, two two different bags of medical right. equipment. And uh, But the infantrymen, some of them were loaded down with bazookas, machine guns, uh, ammunition, and uh, uh, this is, uh, when we landed on the beaches, a lot of them, we had to, uh, the landing craft, they had ramps in the front that dropped down. And when we got close to the, uh, to the beaches of Normandy, uh, the order was given to prepare to debark from the landing craft uh, of dropping the ramp. And the particular boat that I was on, we got marooned on the top of uh, one of the German obstacles. The Germans had placed obstacles way out beyond the low tide area into the ocean just for that particular purpose to keep the boats from uh, getting too close to the beaches. And this is what happened to us. And the boat that I was, that I was on uh, got uh, obstructed by one of these uh, underwater obstacles and uh, the, the the navy man said uh, prepare to depart i'm marooned and i am have to drop the ramp uh, we were so prepared to debark so he dropped the ramp and uh, of course when he dropped the ramp we were under constant uh small arms fire machine gun fire mortars and uh artillery small artillery and the men that were standing in the front of the ramp went down. Many of them were killed on the spot or wounded, very seriously wounded. 
and therefore when I jumped off the boat off the landing craft I landed in the water up to my chest and uh, the infantryman when he jumped in he was so loaded down with uh, with heavy equipment and ammunition and so forth that a lot of them even just sank to the bottom and drowned because uh, they had too much equipment on them. And uh, when I jumped off, I landed, as I said before, I landed in water up my chest, but I was able to touch the bottom of the, uh, the area with my feet. And I eventually made it. I made it to these obstacles that the Germans had once they got uh, up above the water lines uh, I was able to make it to these objects and I used these objects to hide behind as I proceeded to the beach. This is what everybody did. Uh, we used these objects, they were metal uh, crisscross criss -cross ob yeah. objects and uh, we used these for protection to get to the beach because uh, everything, hell, hell had broke loose when we when we got, uh, when we left the landing craft. And I was able to make it up, uh, up to the beaches uh, by using these uh, uh, underwater obstacles for protection. And uh, of course, this is what everybody was doing. I was not alone. Everybody was doing the same thing. And once I got, uh, far enough up the beaches out of the water that I could make a dash for the uh, for the embankments and get behind the embankments uh, where the debris had been washed up for a few hundred years onto the and built up a protective wall and I was able to get up to the beaches and get behind this uh, area where the debris had washed up and use it for protection and then this is where I was uh, chose the spot and I was treating the wounded. Mm. And while I was doing this, I had to glance about out back out to the sea and I saw that uh, many men were laying on the beaches that had been wounded and uh, they could not help themselves because they had been, some of them had been severely wounded. The tide was coming in very fast and I knew that they were destined to drown if nobody came to their assistance. So I dropped what I was doing and I returned to the water and uh, I proceeded to give the men assistance. Many of the men were much bigger because I was quite small for my, for my uh, well, I was a small man, I was not a big man. And many of them were much heavier than I was and uh, one of the, I had a friend that saw me doing this and uh, he did not know how I could do it because he, as I told you before, the men, some of the men were much bigger than I was. But I rolled them over on their back and cut up under their arms and I was able to pull them up to the high water mark where I knew the water would uh, reach and that would be, be it. And I did not treat them. I just pulled them up to that area and left them there for other medics to treat them because uh, there were so many men I was bringing as many as I could up to this particular area. And you did that until you couldn't do it anymore? I did that until uh, once I had to take a break and uh, eventually I became completely exhausted and I could not do it anymore. And this was in the Easy Red sector. Uh, that was Easy Red, yes. Easy Red yeah. sector. Uh, so you're, as you're rescuing, pulling as many men out of the water as you can. Uh, you're treating as many men as you can. You're, you're. It's just probably chaos yeah, all around. Chaos. Oh yes, chaos. Yeah. Chaos. Um, do you remember anything specific from that day with all the action going on? Is there anything that you could, that sticks out uh, in your mind? No, uh, that was, uh, that was about it. I, 
It's crazy. They just tried to save people by dragging them up to the water line yeah. so that they would not drown. And uh, after after the that day, very long day, very difficult day, uh, you eventually made it into the draw. Uh, yeah, well, or, uh, uh, into the, the Germans had established uh, what they called uh, defense points up and down the beach into the draws that were leading up to uh, various parts of the the French coast, uh, small villages, and these draws, the Germans had uh, put in uh, cement, uh, small cement uh, protective uh, uh, bunkers, and they had a machine gun, one man, uh, two men, operated by two men with a machine gun and rifle, and these men were sh shooting uh, at the invaders as they left the uh, troop ship, uh, the, the landing right. craft, and got up into the beaches. And uh, these, the French points, they called them, num they had them numbered, 60, from 60 on up. And uh, I landed in front of defense point number 62. And this was operated by a German man by the name of Heinz Severlo, who I eventually met. Uh, he survived the war also, and I met him uh, in 19, uh, hope, I don't remember what year, anyway. Okay. It was very, very long after the war. I met him at, uh, he was visiting the beach areas also, he survived. He was taken prisoner, went into prison camp, and uh, after the war he was released and went back home. Uh, well, I just met him, I did not shake his, I would not shake his hands or anything, and uh, I was introduced to him, but that was... Uh, and you said that he said at some point that he had killed he killed, uh, he was responsible for the deaths of over 200 Americans just with his machine gun. Wow. And when I returned to the water, I know that uh, when I returned to the water to do the rescue work that I was doing, he had pinpointed me and I could see the shells hitting the sand around my feet, but uh, I survived. He did not hit me. Uh, why do you think you s survived? What What do you believe? Uh, who do you believe protected well, you that day? I uh, contribute my survival to the prayers of my mother. This is probably, nobody would believe this, but uh, this is what I contributed to my survival to the prayers of my mother. And when... Uh, when you met that German, when you met Heinz, uh, that has to be a tough, tough situation to, you know, to meet somebody like that. Yeah. Uh, were you open to meeting him, or did you really just not want to? No, I did not have one to do yeah. with him. Yeah, I don't. I was, uh, I was told who he was and uh, what he had done. He was a, uh, he was operating a machine gun on that particular beach exactly in front of where I landed and uh, I knew that he had killed uh, over 200 Americans and, but that was it that did not want to be associated with him um, when you were uh, first of all did you get seasick were you able to, did you get seasick as well? No, I, I did not get seasick because I, uh, I come from the state of Maine and uh, I grew up as a child. I grew up on the coast of uh, Maine. Okay. And while I was there as a young boy, my brother and I, we became acquainted with fishermen in, in that area. This okay. was in Lincolnville Beach, Maine. And uh, 
they used to take us out into their uh, boats, into their fishing craft when they were going out to pull in the nets. And uh, okay. so I was accustomed to the motions of a boat on the ocean. So I did not get sick, but many of the men were sick. Did, um, when did you, when, when you, and I, I just take it a quick step back, but when you were on the ship, when you were on the ship, did they finally tell you where you were going? At that point, did oh, they yeah, tell you? Oh yeah, we knew. That we knew what, what, what after what, they after they put you on the ship, they yeah. told you. Okay. Well, we knew beforehand okay. that we were trading for something big, and we thought, right. and we had some of the men had figured out where it was going to be. They even knew where it was going to be and okay. where we were going. So it was a common knowledge by that time. And did they? feed you on the ship was it good food bad food do you have any can you remember that at all did the navy did the navy feed you when you were on the ship like when oh, you were yeah, preparing we had uh, we had food uh, we had food we had we were given rations to take with us uh, the navy the army had produced uh, what they call c ration k rations and so forth these were little packages of food uh, that had been prepared by the army that contained uh, a meal, a normal meal, not a normal meal, but canned food. Right. And we had coffee and cigarettes in these packages. Okay. And these were prepared for the, for the by the army for these, for this purpose. So, after the first day on, on the beach, you were probably exhausted. Yes. You had to be exhausted. Yeah. Uh, and you camped out or you stopped that first night uh, yeah. once you got into the, yeah. the well, hills. Uh, as I told you before, when uh, the ramps went down, many men were killed immediately right. or wounded. Right. And... Uh, some of them were not able to make it to the beach. Some of them drowned because of the heavy equipment that they were carrying. But uh, I eventually made it to the beaches. And right. uh, as I said before, I got behind. I found a place where I could work and treat the men. And I was a, a safe area, as much as safe as it could be. Right. And so when... Uh after the for after the first day after that day was over with you finally got a little bit of rest hopefully well uh yeah uh, i eventually uh our objective was uh colville sumer a small village that is located uh, in the area of the cemetery that has now been established and uh, this was our objective for the 16th Regiment was uh, supposed to capture this little village and use it as a point of uh, support for us and protection. And uh, when I left the boat, I got separated from my unit, of course. Mm -hmm. We had, uh, I think we had about 75% casualties, Jeez. dead and wounded. So we were in a, not an effective combat unit anymore. And uh, uh, well, I've lost my line of thought now, but. Uh, As your objective was Colville Sumer? My objective was Colville Sumer, and uh, oh yes, and then I had become, I became uh, isolated from my unit. Okay. And I eventually found my way up to the draw on my way to Colville, Sumer, uh, Colville. and uh, but I became I was exhausted by that time. That was late late in the afternoon on the 6th of June. Yeah. And uh, of course there was a lot of killing going on around me and uh, uh, a lot of action. And I eventually, I left the beach and I was able to find my way up to the draw on my way to Colville Sumer, but I was so exhausted that I eventually fell asleep. Yeah. I had to lay down and go to sleep. And uh, it was still light, I think. But anyway, when I woke up in the morning, I 
and saw that the places I had chosen to sleep I was surrounded by dead Germans and dead Americans that had been killed in the battle. And uh, this is why I woke up in the morning. It was not it was very early in the morning. And then when I woke up, I proceeded and I eventually found, uh, I, I reached Colville mm -hmm. and I found that uh, they had already established and put up a tent as a, for a uh, casualty, a, a casualty for an aid station. And, uh, and of course, many of the medics had been killed. Uh, our our uh, medic that was in charge of the uh, uh, medical aid station, he was wounded and he was uh, did not uh, make it. And I reported in and told them what happened and that I had become separated from my unit and. I think I stayed maybe a few hours or maybe overnight again, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was eventually, I rejoined the company that I had been assigned to. And from that point, you proceeded inland with yeah, them. Yes, yes, we proceeded inland and uh, well, that was it. In the hedgerows, in the hedgerows. In the hedgerows, yes. Mm -hmm. And then you went from place to place. Yes. From there, Jeez. <laughs> um, and so you were in Normandy for um, how many days was he in Normandy? Three months. Three months in in Normandy, and you uh, went all around, obviously through through Normandy. Uh, do you remember the French people? Did you meet many French people at that point? Uh, well, yeah, eventually we uh, met uh, French families uh, in the little villages that we entered. And of course, uh, they gave us uh, what they had. They did not have much themselves, sure. but they gave us uh, bread and jam or whatever to eat. And uh, they always presented us with a glass of wine. And they were very nice to us. Did they seem to be very happy to see the oh, yes, they were, Americans? It was a sad allies. situation because uh, they had also had lost many of their family members who had been killed or wounded because of the bomb and then the fight, of course, the Germans. And, well, it was complete chaos. Sure. And so after you after you left Normandy, after you left Normandy, where did you go from there? When you well, I don't know. We, I went to a lot of different did, villages, but I don't remember the names of them. Did you? It, it, did they? Did you get to go back to England though? At some point, when did no, they? No, when no. did they pull you back no. from the front? I stayed in the war, and I eventually, uh, the first infantry infantry division, uh, we captured the first German city in Germany, right, which was Aachen. Uh, the 26th uh, Regiment, which yep. was also part of the uh, second, uh, the uh, 16th Regiment, right. uh, went into the city and took it over. They, I think, I think they fought for one month before they were able yep. to capture yep. the city. And the 16th Regiment and the 18th Regiment were on the flanks, protecting them while they were doing the job. And this, I think, it took them a month. To finally capture and you were there for that you were part of that too and we were part of that yes wow when did you get a break when did you get get away from the fighting for the first i mean from the yeah i don't remember that but wow uh, that's a long time to be um so after after uh after that uh where did you go then after the uh, Aachen and the Siegfried line and, and all that? Uh, do you remember? Uh, well, before that, uh, I think uh, I think we went into St. Lo before, I don't know. St. Lo. We were in Normandy in St. Lo. Normandy. Yeah. We, we, had, we did a lot of fighting yeah. in Normandy. Uh, we took many small villages and yeah. uh, one of the biggest uh, objects was St. Lo where we fought. Uh, 
eventually we just moved on. Uh, kept going. Kept on going. Into... Were you usually able to, were you walking usually, or did they put you in uh, yeah, jeeps? Well, they used to put us in trucks, so uh, if we had uh, uh, to move great distances, uh, sometimes we went by truck. Okay. And when the trucks could not get very close to the front lines, uh, we left the trucks and we had to proceed on foot. Did they did they eventually bring in new soldiers to replace the the men who were lost in on? Uh... Oh yeah, we had to have replacements uh, shortly, even after VD Day. Wow. We had to go into a rest area and uh, be re had received replacements to replace the men that had been killed or wounded because uh, as I said before, the company that I was in, we lost, I think on D-Day, we lost about 70% of our men either killed or wounded in the first hours. Can you mention briefly your 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 friend uh, who we visited yesterday? At the oh yes, well, Edward Morosovic uh, was his name, he was a medic. And uh, I remember training with him. I did not know him that good, yeah. but uh, I knew who he was, and uh, we both knew each other. And, and this is this is a picture. It's a picture of him, and he was he was killed. And he was killed. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, he was not killed. He was wounded very seriously. I was walking the beaches and I found him. Uh, he was on the beach and he had been, he had a serious uh, stomach wound. And, uh, and I knew that he was, we both knew he, that he was dying because uh, he had a very serious stomach wound and he was slowly bleeding to death. And uh, so I treated him tried to bandage him up, which was very difficult because uh, he had an open stomach wound and it was very difficult to bandage. But anyway, I bandaged him up as best I could. I gave him a shot of morphine and uh, I stayed with him and tried to comfort him. And he eventually died while I was sitting, standing there, uh, while I was treating him, he eventually died. And, Well, I left him, and uh, well, he, he died. That's all. And and yeah. many years later, you were able to meet his family. Uh, yes, many years later, I was uh, I f was able to finally find out where he came from. I did not know where he was from, and uh, I did not uh, was not able to find out until I think uh, two thousand. 2009, I think, when I first came to Europe, and I was able to find out uh, eventually that he came from New Jersey and that he had still had some family. He had one sister that was still living, and uh, I went uh, to New Jersey with a friend of mine by the name of... Uh, uh, Russ Butler. Russ Butler. He, he accompanied me. And the day that we went there, they were holding a ceremony for him with the uh, uh, Legion, uh, no, not uh, the uh, PFW or the American Legion. Reserve units of some sort. And they were holding a ceremony for him. And uh, I was able to present him with uh, a document. I made a photo, a framed picture, and I was able to present his medals. I was able to get his medals that he was entitled to. Wow. He had the silver star and the purple heart, and uh, I presented them to his sister because they did not know anything about him. They knew that he was killed in action. Yeah. But I was able to give them some uh, concrete information because I was with him when he died. And <clears throat> you actually 
served in Korea as well. Yeah, and then uh, in uh, yeah in 1950, I was uh, I had just come back from Europe. I was in Europe for a number of years. I got married in Europe, and I came back to the states with my wife. And uh, I was uh, I went back to Fort Devens, and there I was assigned to the Third Infantry Division. And uh, they were prepared to go to Korea. I did not know that when I joined them, like, but I soon found out that we were on our way to Korea. So I had to leave my wife here in my mother's home, and. Uh, we debarked for Korea by train to San Francisco. And from there we bought the ships and went to, on our way to Korea, we stopped at Honolulu. And then uh, proceeded to Japan, where we went into training for a couple of months. And in 1950, we went, I think in November, uh, we boarded ships in, in Japan, across the Sea of Japan to North Korea, and uh, proceeded, our mission was to assist a Marine, first Marine division that had been isolated uh, by the Chinese when they entered the war. And this was in North Korea mm -hmm. at the Chosun Reservoir. And uh, we were successful. We got them out of their position. And, uh, but we had to be evacuated again by ship because we could not hold the land. Yeah, we were because surrounded. It was, it was uh, uh, controlled by the Chinese and the, and the North Koreans. Wow, and how long were you in Korea? I was in Korea for one year. One year. Jeez. 11 months, I think. And then you finally got to come home for good? And then I was sent home, went to Fort Devens, uh, Fort, uh, uh, in Texas. Uh, oh, Fort Sam Houston. Fort Sam Houston, yes. And uh, I was told there, I found out that I was going to go to another infantry organization outfit. Yeah someplace in Louisiana and my enlistment was coming to an end at that particular time so I uh, went to the authorities that were in charge of me and uh, I said uh, and my enlistment was coming to an end I said asked if I could stay in Fort Sam Houston because my enlistment was coming to an end within a few weeks and uh, I was I was going to get out of the army because I had had enough of the army. Sure. And uh, I did not know what I was going to do, but I was going to get out. Of, and so they agreed. They let me stay there, and I got a job as a first sergeant. At, and Fort Sam Houston was a medical. Was a, at that particular time was a medical training unit. They did a lot of trained a lot of medics in Fort Sam sure. Houston. And I got a job as the first sergeant at one of the training companies. Wow. And so you went, so you were a PFC on D-Day, or a, yeah. a, a private on D-Day. Yeah. And then when you left the army, you were in E-8. I was an officer sergeant. Yes. Wow. That's quite, that's quite a uh, rapid uh, rise, although you yeah, went through well, a lot to get there. Well, it's not rapid. I think it was uh, two or three years. Yeah, yeah. that's still... That's pretty fast, at least in, in, in uh, and so when you, when you left, when you finally were able to, to leave the army, uh, you and your wife settled, well, when did yeah, you take well, the job? We, well, uh, we went, uh, I told, I got my wife and I told her, well, we'll go back to Europe, to Vienna. That's right. And, uh, well, that's what we did. And then I eventually went broke because I had no more money. Yeah. I did not have any income. I could not get a job in Vienna, and uh, I came back to the States. I told my wife I'm going back to the States. I was in the 
I had enlisted in the Air Force Reserve in Fort Sam Houston when I got out of the Army. I went into the Air Force okay. Reserve in rank. I had retained my rank and everything. And uh, I came back and I requested uh, active duty with the Air Force and they accepted me. I went to uh, New York. I don't remember the name of the base, but uh, I went to New York and at an um, Air Force base and yep. went on active duty. And then I had my wife come back over. And then you retired eventually from... And then I retired eventually uh, in about well, 20 years. Uh, I think 1944, well no, that's when I got out of the Army. Yeah, well, in 1945, I, I had served in Germany again, and uh, I got out of the Army in 1945. Yeah. Oh, wait, no. And then you joined the Air no, Force no, after? No, that was not. Uh, nine, 1965, I think. 65, yeah. okay. You yeah. left the military for good. That's when I got to retirement. And is that when you took the job with the, with the UN? Yeah, and... Uh, then when I got out of the army completely, 1965, we moved back to Vienna. We went immediately, loaded up our car and everything, and, and went back to Vienna. Uh, by that time, we had an apartment there that we had bought, and uh, we had a place to go. Went to Vienna, and uh, I was looking for a job, and I found out that the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency was had its headquarters in Vienna. So I went there and applied for a job, and uh, I was told uh, that uh, they were reluctant to give me a job. And, but one of the wo a woman, a German woman in the uh, uh, personnel department, uh, said that uh, I should go to the United States representative to the Atomic Energy Agency, who had its office in Vienna, and talk with him. So I don't remember what his name was, but I went to visit with him. And he was a, uh, a World War II veteran. In fact, he had lost his arm. One of his arms, I think his left arm, he had lost in the war. And uh, when he found out that I was a veteran and that I had spent 20 years in the Army, he helped me immediately. He says, okay, he says, uh, you go there and there and there, and, and uh, I'll call and and uh, we'll arrange for you to have a job immediately. So that's what I, I did, and I was taken, I was uh, employed immediately. Wow. Within a couple of days. And you worked there for? And I stayed there for 20 years. I, I uh, did not retire from the, let's see. Oh yeah, I retired from the United Nations in 1985. Okay. And uh, during that time, I had built my own home in, in Austria, outside of Vienna, in a small village. I did my work myself, bought my piece of ground and built myself a home. And then we had it very comfortable. We had a city apartment. We had a city uh, house outside of this, in the little village outside of the city. And uh, I had two cars, so I had a very good life. <laughs> you did, and that's one of the most yeah. beautiful places in the world. Yeah. <laughs> and so you, sta you stayed in Vienna for quite a while after I stayed that. in Vienna, yes. Uh, oh, yes, and then uh, when I had retired from the... Uh, Atomic Energy Agency. I got a a, a job with a uh, uh, with a limousine service. A, a, a family that had uh, was had a limousine service, and uh, they were uh, taking on uh, people that visited Austria. And wanted to look to the various surrounding countries and sure. And I got a job with that company as a limousine service, and I worked, I think, uh, 
well, I think until uh, I had worked an additional five, 10 or 15 years. And by the time I finally retired, I was 75 years old. Okay. And then uh, eventually you uh, returned back to Maine uh, yeah, and then for a uh, while. In uh, 2000, uh, well, I told my wife, I said, uh, once I in retire entirely and I don't work anymore, or I cannot work anymore, we'll go back to the state of Maine. Okay. And uh, that is what I did. But I had to get uh, permission from a doctor because my wife was very ill at that time. And uh, we came back in 2003. We came back to the Indian Reservation. I had inherited a home my aunt's home, which I had repaired over the years. We would come back in the summertime and repaired the home, made it very comfortable. And uh, then uh, we came, moved back to stay on the reservation in 2003. In, and we got here on the first on the thirty uh, first of May, and on the third of uh, September she died. She was very ill when we left left Vienna. And so you you stayed there uh, on the reservation and continued to live there. You uh, yeah. visited Normandy frequently. Uh, yeah, I. I I made my first visit to Normandy in, uh, I think, in 2009. Okay. I had uh, a very good friend that was a uh, distinguished professor of anthropology that I had met. Uh, he was visiting the reservation, and he was, uh, he came from the Netherlands, but he was working with the Indians in the state of Maine, not the Penobscots, but another Indian tribe. And, uh, I met him because he was visiting the Penobscot Indian Reservation. I met his wife first. I met her at my brother's home. And uh, she eventually introduced me to her husband. Okay. And one time while we were talking, he was, uh, uh, he heard me discussing things about Europe and so forth and he said, uh, if he asked if I was, had participated in the Second World War, and I said yes, that I was with the First Infantry Division and had participated in the war in Europe. And uh, he asked me if I had ever been back to Normandy. I said, no, I've never been back. And this was already in 2000. So he says, well, I come from the Netherlands and uh, my wife and I, now my wife is an American, but we go very frequently to Europe, and the next time we go, we'll take you with us. So he uh, arranged uh, to get some uh, money from the uh, first infantry division and uh, uh, another in the state of Maine. I forgot what it was. Yeah. Anyway, he got uh, the money for our trip, and uh, we came back to Europe together. And while and uh, we visited Omaha Beach, I think it was in 2009. That was the first year that I had visited Omaha Beach since uh, since you were there, since the war. Wow! So, and then you <laughs> visited frequently after that. And then I yes, and uh, as I said before, my wife died, and, and uh, I was alone, living alone in sure. in the state of Maine on the reservation. And I came back very frequently to Europe, to Omaha Beach. And uh, one year I came back and uh, I met a man by the name of Russ Butler, who came from New Hampshire. He was here visiting uh, family members of some of the people that he knew that had died on Omaha Beach. And uh, he introduced himself to me and uh, we became friends. And then he said that uh, he knew a woman by the name of uh, Marie uh, Legrand. If I could, if he could introduce me to her and uh, I said, oh, yeah, I have no objection. We have to clear, clear it with uh, Marie. 
so he introduced us and uh, we became very good friends. We corresponded with each other. And then in the year of uh, 2018, she asked, uh, she, we were talking on the telephone, she asked me if I would like to come and live in her home in Normandy. So I was living alone on the reservation and I accepted immediately. And I came to Europe and I have been here ever since. You live in a beautiful, beautiful place. Thank you. <laughs> uh, with, the with the lovely lady who takes good care <laughs> of, of you and everything. Uh, if you could, uh, Charles, talk about talk about what it means to you to represent your heritage uh, with the Native American heritage, and well, to talk about that just a little bit. Well, since we've been here, uh, we have built up a large community. Uh, Marie, first of all, has uh, established a monument on my behalf and it's called the Charles Norman Shea Park. Uh, she wrote up, uh, she, well, before she established this park, she wrote to the various uh, members of the villages that lived on the beach area, in the beach area, I think three villages. She wrote to the mayors and presented her idea to them that she would like to establish a park. Uh, in my name and uh, she got a reply from only one man one mayor from uh, he was uh, the name of the village was uh, Saint, Laurent. Saint Laurent yeah Saint yeah Saint Laurent and uh, he said he had an ideal spot if she if she would come and visit with him he would show her the spot, and uh, and they went to uh, Marie went to the mayor, visited with the mayor, and uh, he had an ideal spot on the beach, and he said he would uh, give her the spot if she would be interested, and uh, she could do what she liked with it, and. Then, this was what happened. And, uh, and what year was that that the monument was established? Uh, 2017. 2017. Yeah. And it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, I was there. You were kind enough to take me there yesterday, and it was yeah. it's just just absolutely beautiful. And what? Talk a little bit about um, the number of Native Americans that were involved in. Oh yes, and then uh, even though the uh, the the park bears my name. We have dedicated it to all Native Americans that participated in the invasion of Normandy uh, on the 6th of June, 1944. Of course, we do not want to forget other men that sac made the ultimate sacrifice, but uh, we wanted to uh, give recognition to Native Americans, especially. Well, and, and that's the only monument of its kind that, that does that, uh, that provides that recognition. And how many Native Americans approximately participated in, in, in uh, the invasion? Well, the, the first, the first, uh, the first establishment of the memorial, we had uh, about uh, 30, Native Americans come the first time we had a, and from that time up until now it has grown to about 50 or 60 Native Americans. And we have uh, been working with Harold Prince, Marie and I, and uh, he has uh, found out all Native Americans that participated in the invasion of Europe that landed on Omaha Beach and other beaches, and uh, I don't know how many. 550. 500. 550 yeah. Native Americans. Native Americans. On D-Day. Yeah. And uh, roughly 24,000 globally in Europe. Globally in Europe. D-Day and after. Okay. 
and that's it's amazing what you've done uh, in, in, with Marie to recognize you know your heritage and, and the sacrifice because as you said back during that time you and your brothers were all fighting for our nation However, you were not even allowed to vote. Well, we're not considered citizens of the United States. <laughs> and you f were first able to vote, you said, in 1954? Yeah. And we did not, we're not able to vote in local elections until 1954. But you can go die for your country yeah. and put your life yeah, on the line. Exactly. Wow. That's, uh, and each year, each year you host uh, a, a series of events with Marie. Yeah. Uh, to, to, to bring Native American families over every single year and you to honor them and their heritage and your heritage. And that's just amazing. And we done. work with a man in the United States that uh, lives in Michigan. Illinois. Illinois, Illinois, okay. Illinois below Chicago. Uh, he has a, uh, a large... Uh, Art gallery? A what? Art gallery? Art gallery, yes, and he's Native American, and he has uh, many, many, many friends that are Native Americans. And we all work together, and he brings his, uh, he has influenced a large group of Native Americans to join us in our celebrations here wow. on the 6th of June of every year. Uh, it's incredible what you've done uh, with Marie to to not not only honor them and your heritage, but to honor all of those who yeah. who uh, paid the ultimate sacrifice and, yeah. and who participated. Uh, it's it's just yeah, amazing. We do not forget all the men that uh, paid the ultimate price in Europe. And you you visit Eddie's um, and, in yeah, particular. We've, uh, made a special uh, dedication to the man that died in my arms on the beach on the 6th of June, Edward Marzovich. And uh, his sister was alive at that time a few years. She has died since then. And he has many nieces and nephews uh, that uh, we have met and everybody is happy that uh, I was able to give them the information about their uncle and the brother of the woman that was still alive at that particular time because they did not know any uh, details of his death. Well, it was, as we discussed yesterday, it was an open wound for that yeah, family yeah. because they just didn't yeah. know and the government never told them anything about what happened. Yeah, but they never knew what happened to him. And so you are now 95 years old. You're going to be 96. I'll be 96 on the 27th of June. And you, you, you look about 20 or 30 years younger than you actually are. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, what's, what's your secret? What's your secret to being so healthy and, and looking so good at this age? Any, any secrets or advice for for, uh... My secret is uh, Marie. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, she has really done a lot for me. Uh, I've had uh, medical treatment in the States, but uh, for instance, I had a prostate problem and uh, I had a catheter inserted yeah. with a uh, bag for the urine. And I was I had this for one year. Yeah. in place and uh, there's a possibility of infection or whatever sure. which uh, could have sure. caused my death and uh, so when I came to Europe I still had this uh, I was still wearing this catheter and uh, Marie took me to a doctor here and he operated on me uh, solved my problem removed the catheter wow. and uh, He did not even charge me. I was, I did not have to pay for it. Wow. Because uh, of my service to the country and to his country, and he did that. He did the operation for with no charge. That is a, an incredible act of kindness. Yes. However, 
you've provided some free medical services over the years for other yeah. other soldiers and yeah. saved a lot of lives. So I think it's it's very appropriate that that. And then I've had other problems. I've had uh, I have a problem with my uh, hearing, which has been solved, and I had a problem with my eye. I was going blind in my right eye. Uh, Maria took me to an eye doctor, and uh, they are working on that now. And well, I have had very good yeah. uh, medical care here, but through the help, of course, through Maria. Sure. And I always, I always like to ask for the younger soldiers out there, for the younger um, kids that are just now just joining the military, what advice would you give a, a young man today? Well, I would like to say to the young people today that uh, we live in a very beautiful country, democratic country, and uh, there are always people that uh, perhaps would like to destroy our way of life or to take it over. And these young men should always be prepared to defend their way of life. And uh, to continue to enjoy it, they would have, they have, should be prepared to defend their way of life in the United States. And when you, when you were in the army as a very young man, you know, you were sent to a foreign land uh, and you were asked to invade a foreign country and you were asked to go up against the most powerful military in the world at the time, you know, the German military what was the most powerful military in the world. Uh, but it's not like you were on U.S. soil. You were in a foreign country and you were, you know, yes. you were fighting on in, in, in a foreign country to protect a foreign country. What motivated you to drive you forward? What kept you going every single day and gave you the courage to go in into that type of situation? Well, what gave me? You have to understand that uh, when I went into the military service, I had no voting rights. My mother was an advocate for the pe for her people, and uh, but. I was still motivated to participate in this operation uh, through my desire to protect the way of life that I had been living up until that time, in spite of the fact that I had no voting rights or, or was not considered a citizen right. of, of my own country. Right. and. Uh, of course, uh, we succeeded and uh, we were able to defeat one of the most, the strongest uh, armies in the world at that particular time. And uh, I'm very happy for that. Well, thank you for your service and thank you for protecting all of us. And thank you for honoring so many people and making sure, you know, you're, you're, you're uh, paying respect to, to so many people, and it's just amazing what you and Marie are doing. But of course, you have to remember that I was a very small part of uh, this operation. I was an individual that uh, I did what I could, but it was not uh, my. It, there were many, many men that paid the ultimate price, and we should not forget them. Absolutely. Well, you you honor them every day by what you do and all the things that you're doing. You're honoring them every single day. Yes, thank you. And uh, I'm just honored to have met you, and thank you so much for, you know, number one, taking the time to share everything, but number two, for all that you do every day to honor these men. Thank you. Um, so... And thank you, Marie, too, for all that you do.